statistics, standard error, margin of error, hypothesis test, and confidence intervals. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. You're not required. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. But if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section 1940, standard error, margin of error, hypothesis test, and confidence interval tab, breaking down this formula for the standard error, otherwise known as the standard deviation of X bar, which we have seen in the past, but this time we want to see how the calculation changes as we increase n, n being the sample size. Quick recap of our general scenario. We're typically looking at situations where we want to find information about a large population, but we can't test every item within that large population. It's just too big. Therefore, what do we do? We take a sample and we hope that we can apply the findings that we found from the sample to the larger population two techniques typically used, one being hypothesis testing, two being confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing often working well in situations where we believe we know what the middle point is, such as for example, if we, if we have on the bag of peanuts that the average amount of peanuts is so much, then we can sample some bags of peanuts to see if that average is actually true Therefore, we're going to be plotting our information as though the middle point is the average given, that being our hypothesis, and see whether or not the sample is far enough away for us to reject that original hypothesis. When we have confidence intervals, that often leads itself to situations where we don't know where the middle point is. That's what we're trying to find. Therefore, whatever we get from the sample the average, we're going to basically assume that as the middle point and create some type of range around it. Now, we could create the range using a hypothesis testing method saying, hey, if this is the middle point, I can choose something over here and say, what if I make that the hypothesis? What if this was the average value? Would my actual result be far enough away into the tail for, must, for me to reject that hypothesis? And I can repeat that question for every point around the middle point that I came up with, resulting in a range which would be basically peak to peak and the middle point. But it would be easier if we can choose that middle point from our sample, create the range around it by making the graph around it, possibly using a bell-shaped curve, or in some cases, we might be using T distributions, for example. But the general takeaway here would be that in a hypothesis testing scenario, we build the graph around what we believe to be true, and then we test and see if it's far enough away to reject. With the confidence interval, you're basically uh, building your interval around the result of the sample, right? So let's go back on over here, and we're going to say this is going to be our information. We'll say the mu or the average item cost is uh, 799, so we're thinking about the average cost of an item which is going to fluctuate in cost possibly because we're talking about estimates for example in a construction job or something like that n large n is the item sold in a year so that's going to be our population then large n 34,000. the standard deviation of the population measuring the spread of the population is uh 200 and then the number of standard deviations, the interval that we want to find, 
is two standard deviations away. So remember that when we, when we measure our curve and we graph our curve, we could graph this X in terms of the actual X values or in terms of Z scores where the middle point would be zero measuring in standard deviations. So that's what we're talking about here in terms of our range. We want two standard deviations away. Now remember that our data, whatever data that we have, this data you would think would tend towards kind of a bell-shaped distribution because we're talking about average price of something that probably doesn't fluctuate too much. It would probably fluctuate around a middle point. But in some cases, we might not have that as the case where it might be a uniform distribution of the actual data or skewed to the left or skewed to the right, which means we might not be able to construct a bell-shaped curve on the actual population data. But according to the central limit theorem, if we took all of the combinations of sample sizes, then, and we took the average of all of them, that will tend towards a bell-shaped curve. So the two things that we need for the bell-shaped curve is number one, center point, average or mean. Number two, the spread, standard deviation. The center point will be, will be averaged or approximated no matter what we're using. If we have the actual middle point of the population, then we have that. If we take a sample, the mean of the sample will tend towards that center point. And if we imagine hypothetically that we took all combinations of sample sizes of whatever sample size we're using from the population, then the mean of all those means of all the samples would also tend towards the middle point. But with the standard deviation, that's not the case. If we take the standard deviation of the actual population, then that's gonna be a different number, of course, than the standard deviation of, of X bar that we're looking at here. So we have the standard deviation of the population. We could take the standard deviation of a sample, which should tend towards the standard deviation of the population, but might not be in a bell-shaped curve if the population data is not. And therefore, we're often looking for the standard deviation of all possible combinations of sample of whatever sample size that we have. And that is approximated with this formula, this formula being for X bar when we're not talking about a binomial situation with only two results, but we have, in this case, more than two results. So that's what this formula is doing. We can usually drop off the second bit if n, which is the population size, is relatively large. Therefore, we just have the formula of sigma, which is going to be the standard deviation of the population. If we know that, in some cases we might not. If we don't know what it is, we might have to substitute here the standard deviation of one sample, right? And then over the square root of n, and then n is, of course, what what uh, the sample size is and that's what we're going to vary this time is is uh n so what happens to the standard deviation of x bar measuring the spread of the the data on the bell curve right what happens to that as we increase n which is in the numerator right so you can kind of imagine what's going to happen even though it's the square root of n okay so let's say we have n this is going to be our sample size it goes from 25 to 75 to 250, to, to 350, to 1,000. So our population is the same, 34,000 in the population, but we're changing the sample size. Now, remember this formula is kind of imagining that we take, that we take all combinations of samples of whatever sample side we're using. So note our parameters here, what we need to be thinking about is one, usually the question is, is more better? Is more of N better? Generally, yeah, having a bigger N would be better than not having a bigger N. But remember that there is a limitation to it because you would think that as you increase N, the confidence level and possibly the, the range would, would be uh, better in a, in a standard line or something like that, which isn't, usually, isn't actually the case because it's that soup analogy where if you have a small can of soup and you take a teaspoon of soup to test the salt, you can test the salt. If you have a very large can of soup uh, for a, a whole kettle of soup, you still can stir it up and have a fairly small sample to, to test the saltiness of the entire kettle of soup. You have a similar analogy here, but N being better, bigger is typically... Now, the other thing that N question is, how big does N need to be, the sample, 
in order for us to to have a bell-shaped curve according to the central limit theorem which again if you go over a certain point then you might not get any much more benefit as n goes up past that point is the general idea and then the third question is do i have to use this second bit of the formula and usually that will be dependent on large n the population because if you have a fairly large population little n will not be that big compared to big n which means you usually drop off the second bit of the formula which we only have then normally this first half of the formula which is all we're going to deal with here all right so then the standard error calculation if we were to calculate this then at 25 if we were to plug this into the formula we've got the standard deviation of the population it is what it is it's 200 divided by the square root of n and if n is 25 we get a standard error of 40. the standard error basically being the measure of spread as though we're imagining all possible combinations of 25 out of the population of 34,000 and taking the mean of all of those right that would give us basically our spread or standard deviation of 40. now if we took the margin uh the the margin of error then that's just going to be two standard deviations away so so now we're going to go two standard deviations away so 40 times 2 is going to be 80 and then we can imagine what our range is going to be which is going to be the middle point uh plus the 80. so i can say if if that is 80 we can say that the middle point is 799 plus 80 that's going to be the upper bit and then the lower bit is going to be 799 which is mu up here the average the middle point you're imagining on the bell curve minus 80 two standard deviations away is 80 because one standard deviation or standard error is 40 so that would be our range and then if we did our nor our our calculation in terms of how much is going to be under the curve we're taking a look at p of of seven uh x bars greater than or equal to 719 less than or equal to uh 879 if you want to look how to put that cool little formula in it's a text formula it's actually somewhat complex but we practice that in the excel course or section if you want to take a look at that uh, little tool and then we can do our norm dot dist so if we think about this then we're saying okay if if we looked at our graph we basically we can imagine that we made basically a bell uh, curve type of graph and we're, we took two standard deviations away and then we've got these little bits on the end and and so 95 percent of the data in a normal bell-shaped curve about is under the middle part of the curve when we do this norm dot dist what it does is it calculates from the left to the right so what we can do is if i'm trying to measure the middle part let's say of this long curve if I'm trying to make the middle part, I can calculate the area up to this bit. And then I subtract the area up to this bit, which leaves us with the middle bit. So that means that that if we take a look at the norm.dist calculation, where did it go? Here it is. Norm.dist is the X uh, and then the mean and then the standard deviation, the standard error and the cumulative depreciation and then one. Uh, because it's cumulative minus norm dot dist of uh, the second bit right so we're taking the norm dot dist of up to the larger point which is this 879 minus the norm dot dist of the lower point the point is here that we're getting the the percent under the curve of that middle bit of 95 percent about 95.45 because we measured this to be two standard deviations that would be kind of like our confidence interval if you're thinking about it in terms of confidence interval. now what happens if we increase n to 75 now of course we're taking a larger sample of n out of a population of 34,000, which is typically good that would typically be better what are we going to do then well the margin of error if we plug that into our formula 200 remains the same at the numerator standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n which is now larger which means that the standard error has gone down so that me measures the spread the standard error is measuring the spread 
So what's the margin of error? Well, if this is one standard error, which represents basically one standard deviation, and we want to be within two standard deviations, we can simply take that amount of the 23.09 times two. That means our distance from the middle point on either side of the bell curve is going to be 46.19 if we're measuring in X's as opposed to Z's. And then the lower point is going to be the middle here, 799. And then we're going to say minus the 46. 0.19 gives us our lower point of the range. The upper point of the range is going to be the middle point of our curve, 799 plus 46.19 gives us the 845.19. Uh, and so then if we look at our formula here, this is just going to give us the P of sub the bottom bit to the top bit, right? The middle part of the graph, once again, norm.dist, where we're taking X up to the higher point minus norm dot dist of x to the lower point gives us the 95. So the percent is the same here. Why is the percent the same? Because because we're, we we have a, a lesser range because the standard error uh, is smaller, right? So that's what happens when that's what kind of you would expect if n goes up. The way we're calculating it here is we still have the 95%, which you can think of kind of as similar to like a confidence level, the likelihood that it's going to be under the curve. However, the 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 graph is getting, you can imagine it's getting tighter around the center point, right? So we have a smaller range. So that would be normally good, right? That would mean that as N goes up, it's getting kind of like better right in that there in that it's going to be a tighter graph around that center point and then if i go up to the next one now we jumped up to uh 250 so the standard error calculation would be once again the uh 200 remains the same square root of n which jumped up from 75 to 250 so that means our standard error is 12.65 so it's going down which is typically good but notice it's not going down like in a linear decrease, right? The dis right because we went from 75 to 250, and we only went from 23 down to 12 versus 40 down to 23 when there was a change of a uh, sample of 25 to 75, right? So then we get our margin. Our margin of error is simply going to be this 12.65 times two because we're going two standard deviations out. So the lower bit then is going to be the middle point, 799 minus the margin of error, 25.3. And then the upper bit is going to be the middle point, 799 plus the margin of error, 25.3. And that's going to give us there. And then if we looked at our, our curve, we are once again calculating the norm.dist of the upper bit minus the norm.dist of the lower bit. We're still going to get to 95.45, but now we're talking about a curve which is tighter around the center point. Okay, and we'll see this visually in a second. Now we'll go to the next one. So if it goes from 250 up to 350, now our formula, still 200 up top for the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size, which has now gone up to 350, meaning our standard error has decreased to uh, 1065. Now, once again, it went up by 50, and we, but we only had a change of 1265 to 1065. And then we have the margin of error then is just going to be twice of that. So now we have 10.69 times two because we're going two standard deviations out. And then our lower bit is going to be 7, 799 minus 21.38. And our upper bit is simply going to be the 799 plus 21.38. And then our calculation for the middle part of the curve is once again, norm.dist of the upper bit minus norm.dist of the lower bit, which once again gives us the 9545 under the curve, but the curve is tighter. Uh, there's less spread in the curve. And then if we go all the way up to from 350 to 1000, now we put one, we put uh, sigma still 200 standard deviation of the population over square root of N, which is now going from 350 all the way up to 1000. But we only really had a difference going from 10, uh, 
65 standard error, the spread standard deviation of X bar, that means to the 632. So it's gotten tighter, but you can see the relationship isn't going up. It's not like a straight line as we increase the, the sample size. So now if I take that 6.32 times two, we get the 12.65, and then the lower bit is gonna be the 7.99 minus the 12.65 and that's going to be the 786. The upper bit is going to be the 799 plus the 12.65. And then, of course, we're still going to have a range. And under that center point is going to be the 95.45, but we have a tighter graph. Okay, so let's imagine that we, we populate our graph information now to see a visual example of this. So we do this in Excel where we have two, we're going to graph two lines. If you want to see it in Excel to see how you build that out in Excel, you can check that out in another course or section. But here we're just going to say A is going to be 25 and B is uh, 1000, the standard error. So And so what we're doing is we're taking N, we put a formula into Excel to say, hey, look, if N is 25, then pull the proper standard error over. So 25 pulled over the 40 and 1000 pulled over the 6.32 for the calculation so that's going to give us then the the uh, mu which is always the same that was given as known the 799 that's going to be the middle point in both uh, situations all we're changing is the sample size and that in turn changes the standard error calculation given the formula that we just took a look at so we did an, an X lookup formula so that it looked up these amounts. This is the formula used to then it, so then it pulled in these amounts down here. If you want to check that out in our Excel presentation for more detail, you can do that. Now, when we graph this, what we're doing is saying, I want to make a graph now that has a range in X's rather than in Z's large enough to encompass the entire curve. So I went four standard deviations out from like the middle point at 75. Now this was a kind of wonky because we because the graph would be wider uh, depending on what end was, right? So I picked 75, which is pretty, which is closer to the to the low point, and then we went four standard deviations up and down from there. So if I took if I took the middle point, in other words, of 799. Or let's take four standard deviations. Standard deviation is uh, 23.09 standard error times four instead of two, because now I'm graphing the whole graph. So I want everything to fit in the graph. That would be this. And then I'm going to say plus the 799. That would be the upper point. And then we'd say minus to get to the lower point, right? So there's the 891. So here's my range that I'm going to then use my X's to graph out here. So I put the range starting at 707, and then we went up to 791 on the X's. We used a sequence formula to do that, which just said, I want you to take this minus this plus one. That's how many X's we want. And then the columns, just one column. And then we want to start at uh, this number, 707. And then we took steps of one at a time, meaning 707, 708, and so on. And then we calculated uh, the P of X or F of X. This is norm.dist. And then we took the X, which is this, and the, the mean, which we said was 799 here. And then we took uh, the standard deviation, which uh, for A was this one. And then we took the cumulative it's not going to be cumulative. That's a zero. And then for B, same thing, norm.dist. So we took X, which was this, the mean, which is 799, the same. And then the standard deviation, which is for the second one. That's what changed because we had a different sample size, 6.32. And then it's not cumulative. We graph those out. And then we plotted those just using a line graph this time. And then you can see the differences here, right? So the idea being when we had a larger when we have a larger n then you're going to get a tighter graph around the middle point. So we have the same middle point but a larger n is going to be tighter around the middle point less deviation 
And therefore, when we're thinking about a range that's going to be around there, two standard deviations out is on each of them, two standard deviations is going to be around 95% of the data about, right? But it's a lot tighter of a range here because you have a tighter graph. Two standard deviations here is going to be a lot longer uh, uh, range that you're going to have. So that's that's going to be the general idea. So the, the bottom line is a bigger sample size is good and it will have more of an impact as, as it goes from zero up. But then the, the benefits that you're getting as it continues to go up might not be as... Uh, as it's not going to be like a straight line due to that analogy with the soup and the salt <laughs> and so on. And, and so that's going to be the idea. All right. So now let's, let's say that we took the standard deviation. So here's just our same data, the mean 799 standard deviation of population 200. And we're going to say that the population is 34,000. We're going to say this time we take the sample size of the 350. And then uh, the X bar mean sample is uh, is going to be 850. So that's going to be the of the sample X bar of the sample as opposed to the 799 of the actual population. So the question is, is H0, which is the hypothesis test that we're thinking, reasonable? So now we're going to use our, here's our formula for our calculations over here. And let's do this two different ways. We'll think about hypothesis testing and then confidence intervals. And we'll do more problems on, on these in the future, but this is just our general intro. So if, we're, if we say that, if we say that, uh, First question, n over large n, which is which is the sample over the population, is that uh, less than 5%? So this is our check figure uh, to see whether or not we need to be using this second bit, which is the correction factor. You will recall that if n is large, it's likely that you're not going to need the correction factor, and that is often the case, which means you could drop off this second bit which is what we've typically been doing. And you can see that this uh, is less than 5%. So we're not going to be using that second bit of the formula. So then we have the uh, X bar, the standard error, the standard error calculation. And so now we're going to, we can take that. That's going to be our formula. Where did my calculator go? My calculator is missing. I see it. It's been hidden over here. So now we're going to say, all right, so we have the, well, actually, I won't use the calculator because I don't, the square root's kind of a pain to do, but the standard error, we're going to say uh, that, that we have the sigma, the sigma is going to be the standard deviation uh, of the population. And so that's going to be the 200 divided by the square root of N. And we said our sample size was 350. That should get us to the 10.69 about. Now notice this is supposed to be sample, sampling error. So this was the error that we know is there. And that's just simply what we came up with, 830 minus what is the actual population, which is the 799. So it's $31 off is what that is trying to say, even though it is spelled incorrectly. So we're going to say that alpha is going to be 5%. Now, oftentimes we just basically choose uh, what alpha is going to be. In other words, oftentimes we're going to say we want a confidence level of 95%, which is about two standard deviations out, as we saw. And therefore, alpha is measuring the ends of the graph. So if 95% is in the middle, then alpha is measuring these two tails on the end, which would be 5%, half of 5%, 2.5 on each of those tails. So then we have alpha uh, over 2, which means the 5% divided by two is going to give us the 0.025, 2.5% on each side of the tails. And then we've got the Z, and this could be calculated uh, in terms of how many standard deviations out would it be. And it's around two standard deviations. And we can calculate that in Excel with our norm.s.inverse we're taking one because that's going to be a hundred percent because we're looking at that upper bit one minus then the, and it, when it's looking for the probability, this one's looking for this one. 
uh, which is the, the, the top bit, 0.025 in this case. So if you want to get more into detail on those formulas, we can take a look at that. Uh, you can take a look at the Excel course or section and then the margin of error. So these are two standard deviations almost above and below to get 95% confidence because you recall around 95% is within two standard deviations about, right? 1.96. So now we're going to say, all right, so we're going to take then the standard error, the measure of spread for one standard deviation, 10.69 times the 1.96. And that's going to give us our margin of error, meaning the, the spread on each side of the middle point of 12.95. And then we have the lower X bar, which is going to be uh, the middle point, the middle point. Now, when we're doing hypothesis testing, we're going to assume that the hypothesis was that the middle point was given at that 799. So in this case, we're taking the 799 and the lower bit minus the margin of error, 20.95. That gives us the 778.05. And then the upper bit is going to be the middle point of the 799 799 plus the margin which is going to be plus the 20.95 so there's the uh 819 and so there we have that and then we have uh compare sample mean so now we can do our comparison here and say okay well here's the sample that we took and we came out to 830 so according to our range that we found around the middle point that was assumed, right? It was assumed that the average price in our case would be 799 and we built our bell our range around that and then we came up with something that is not in between there, right? This is this is above the top part and therefore that might be evidence for us under a hypothesis testing thought process to reject the original uh, null hypothesis would be the general idea. Now we did a little uh, uh, um, if then function in order to populate uh, an, a true or false. In this case, we said false. And then we can do an X bar of uh, the Z score. In other words, we can measure this in Z's instead of X's. So we're going to say, okay, if this if this is what we actually found, the 830, so we're going to say this was 830, minus the middle point, the average 799 is what we hypothesized. There's that difference of 31 divided by the, the standard error, which is basically the spread, right? Divide, standard deviation, in essence, that we're using 10.69. That's going to give us our uh, 2.9 about, and that 2.9 is is above the 1.69 that we wanted to be within. So now when we think about it in terms of Z-scores, we are once again outside. So we've, we've looked at it in terms of this, this uh, X here can be measured in X's, and then we can also measure it in Z's, which are in standard deviations around two standard deviations is what we were looking at. And this is over that and therefore would be outside once again. And then we have the p-value and we're measuring the top bit of the graph. So we can use a formula uh, in order to do that. So this is gonna be that Z at the top bit of the graph here, right? So we can say, okay, if that's up here at the top of, of it, then the area under the curve at the top uh, would be under there, right? So now we're saying, uh, we could say, okay, I can calculate that with the norm.dist. And so I'm going to say one minus uh, the norm.dist. And we're going to be picking up the Z, which we calculated up here, which is the 2.9. And then we're going to say it is cumulative and then multiply it times two, because basically what this would be calculating is the little bit on the ends, right? And that, and you'll recall that around 95 was in the middle and the little bits on the ends would be the 5%, and we want uh, both of them, so there would be 2.5 each. So we want both of them, and so that's only adding one end, so we're gonna multiply it times two, and that gets us to the 37%. Uh, percent.
and that is less than the 5%, which is what should be the area under those tails, right? And so that's another way that we can basically look at it. So these are three ways that we can kind of look at the same information, right? We have our range here and we said, okay, I can build my range around it and say, is this number within it? We can then look at it in terms of Z scores and convert to Z scores and say, okay, is that within the Z score? Or I can calculate the P value and compare that to the, uh, the 0.05 uh, because we wanted a 95% confidence. All right, now, if we were thinking about this in terms of uh, confidence intervals, instead of hypothesis testing, we could say something like this. We have our confidence interval method, and we're gonna basically make a range. Now, the big difference we wanna keep in mind here is that now with confidence intervals, instead of us making our graph around what we assumed to be the middle point, we're now making, we, we often use confidence intervals when we don't know what the middle point is. So now we're going to be making our graph around the, what we came up with from our sample, which is uh, 830. So now we can say, okay, well, that's going to be our middle point, 830, instead of the, the, our hypothesis of 799, everything else is going to be the same here because we're assuming that we know what, uh, what the standard deviation of the population is and therefore we can still kind of approximate a normal distribution if we don't know what the standard deviation of the population is and possibly when this population is fairly small we might have to use something like t distributions which will have the same concepts involved but it's we might need that in certain situations so we'll talk about that later but just in terms of the middle point if we know this the idea would be that we're measuring from the 830 so now we're going to say 830 and then the range that we would be constructing would once again be based on the margin of error just like we have here so 830 minus 20.95 is going to give us our uh our 809 and then if we take our middle point of the 830 plus the margin of error plus the 20.95 we get the 850, so then we get the uh, 851 about, and then we can ask uh, the question that is the actual, now we can compare that to the actual 799, was that captured uh, within our interval? Uh, and, and it was not uh, in this case, so that 799 is not within our confidence interval. Now, when we think about confidence intervals, remember the idea would be that we want to have, we can, we're trying to get a 95% confidence that the interval will contain the middle point. However, even if everything went perfectly, we're admitting here that 5% of the time, just randomly, the result is going to be outside of our interval because we only have a 95% uh, confidence level. And so we'll dive into that, the confidence level concept in more detail, this is just kind of an intro between these two concepts and the major takeaway being that when you know what the center point is, you often would use a hypothesis testing situation and construct your curve around that center point and then see if your sample is far enough away to reject the hypothesis. When we don't know what the center point is, we might then use confidence interval situations, in which case we would take our mean of the sample as the middle point and then try to create a confidence interval in some way shape or form around it possible and there's different methods we can use to, to do that we can use a hypothesis testing method and assume that every point around it is the hypothesis and look at the tails to see if we would reject them to make an interval or we can use the middle point and try to create a bell curve to help us out with that which we can only do if the bell curve is appropriate to use in a scenario and in some cases such as when we have a smaller population or sample for example then we might be have to use t distributions which are going to be a similar concept in shape still having a bell curve but they typically have fatter tails around them so that you would have to have a wider interval in order to get the same level of confidence again we'll discuss that more in future presentations